Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Uh, we're breaking from Romans again for one more time. And then it's all the way through Romans 11 till we finish. You haven't finished with Romans yet? Oh, no. <laughs> we're waiting for you to come finish for us. I thought I'd preach um, today from Romans 11 through 16. Oh, would that be all right? We'll just finish go. it. <laughs> you guys want to be done in one sermon? He's willing. <laughs> so... I missed the cue who was uh, introducing my dear brother, so I'm jumping in and I'm going to do it. So guys, this is someone that you've been praying for and hearing about for a long time. This is Matt Layton. He teaches in a seminary in Spain and helps as an elder at one of their churches. He has preached here before when we were doing our study through the five solos of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And so he is our dear brother. And is your family with us? Yep. Oh, Over good. There. Oh, Nuria and all the kids. How many kids you got with you? Three, beautiful. Welcome. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so we've asked our, our dear brother if he'd come and bring us the word of God this morning. So I'm running off. I have a wedding. So I'm going to get to hear you for 15 minutes and then I got to leave. It's not because something you said. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for I telling me. To <laughs> All right. You're up. So that means after 15 minutes, I can really say what I think about Ken, right? <laughs> Wait, Ted. <laughs> Well, I should begin by apologizing. We arrived late this morning at 1020, which is a little tight when you're the guest preacher. And I was wondering which one of the elders is going to substitute me or thinks that he has to substitute me if I don't show up. And I'll tell you who I think it was. I think it was Robert Davis, because when I walked through the doors, his face lit up and he said, brother, how you doing? <laughs> I don't want anybody to be jealous of the greeting that I got from Robert this morning, because that was special. <laughs> but he had something particular that he was concerned about. <laughs> I want to give you just a, a quick update and a word of thanks. Uh, we're really grateful for your ongoing support for our ministry, for your prayers. The last four years have been especially challenging in Spain, just like they were here with COVID, the pandemic, the lockdowns, and all of that. But the Lord's been good to us. Like Ken said, I'm here this morning with my wife, Nuria, three of our kids, our oldest daughter, Tanya, 12-year-old boy, Alex, and a 10-year-old boy, Mark. We have two more that are 20 and 18, Dan and John, and they've sort of, well, at least for now, <laughs> flown the nest, and uh, they're nomading around the United States. They work for a company, and they're working in different places. We're proud of both of them. They're working hard, and I think they're learning a lot of lessons. Uh, in our local church, we struggled through the pandemic. We were closed, we were open, we were closed, we were open. And uh, about, yeah, like halfway through that, our lead pastor, a Spaniard, announced to me that they were leaving to take another church. He and his wife were going to leave, and he was going to take the pastoral ministry in another church. And so I became the lead pastor <laughs> on top of all the other things that I have to do. And you probably saw this, those of you who read our prayer letters, we were asking for fervent prayer that the Lord would provide for us a new lead pastor, and I think we had maybe one of the shortest pastoral searches on record. Um, it didn't take long. Months later, we, we landed on a candidate. His name is Isaac, and maybe that'll be easier, easy for you to remember because we're going to talk about Isaac in Genesis 21 today. His wife's name is Anna. They have two small children. They're expecting a third, and we are so excited about Isaac's ministry. He is a gifted young man. He's got a heart for people, a heart for the lost, and he, he began full-time in January, and even since then, um, we've sensed like a fresh breeze blowing through the church. So we're grateful for his ministry and grateful for your prayers. Uh, the Lord was faithful, and he provided. And in the seminary where I teach, we also had a difficult time through COVID. We had to close down. We had to shut down our residency. I now understand why universities build these beautiful dorms. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, they need to make money. <laughs> they need to rent out the rooms, and, and we're kind of the same way. We have a residency, and we count on it being full. And it was empty, and for us, that was a huge financial blow. We're grateful because we were able to raise money through COVID, thanks in large part to Southside. Y'all made a very generous donation to our COVID emergency fund, which helped us keep our doors open, and we're still functioning. This year, we're excited. Enrollment's back up after a couple of difficult years. And we're excited about some projects that we have for the future, including the beginnings of an online program. We're going to mm, throw out a few online classes this year with the goal of, in maybe three to five years, having most of our program online. That's another thing that you could be praying for. And uh, please pray also 
for a building project that we have. Our, our, our campus, if you can call it that, it's an old beach hotel. And the word beach sounds nice, but the rest of it's not. <laughs> it's very rustic. There's other life besides human in it, just to give you an idea. <laughs> And the local government came by from the city that we're located in, and they inspected it, and they said, well, you guys need to make some upgrades in order to maintain your license for public activities. So we have to fireproof this and forced air that and exterior fire escape and all this stuff. Comes out to like $400,000, which for us is a lot of money. So um, we're grateful. Uh, that's been in some of our prayer letters, too. We're grateful for your prayers. We've, we've raised about a quarter of that so far. Uh, but if you could pray that the Lord would provide for, for that need as well. Over the next couple of years, we'll need to upgrade so that we can stay open. So, very happy to be here with you this morning. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 21. And uh, this is an interesting passage, and I, I want to start by saying that life is full of surprises. And I was surprised a little while back in our preaching rotation in our church in Spain when I got this passage. <laughs> I saw the, the list of preachers and the assigned texts, and I opened up to Genesis 21, starting in verse 8, and I read it, and I thought, what in the world am I going to say about this? <laughs> How does this text apply to Christians in the 21st, 21st century? I was surprised. But I was further surprised as I was studying the text that God turned my expectations upside down. So God's going to intervene, we'll see in this text that we read, but he does so in an unexpected way. So we shouldn't be surprised when God intervenes, but sometimes when he intervenes, he does things that go contrary to our instincts. And I think he does that on purpose because he wants us to learn to live in dependence on him, on his provision, and especially on his way of doing things, not on our way of doing things. So this morning, I'm going to try to explain this text to you. Let's read it, and then I'll tell you in one sentence what I, I think is maybe one of the main applications for us today, and then we'll unpack it a little bit more slowly. Genesis 21, 18, the child grew, the child is Isaac, the child grew and was weaned. Abraham prepared a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah noticed the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, the son whom Hagar had born to Abraham, mocking. So she said to Abraham, banish the slave woman and her son for the son of that slave woman will not be an heir along with my son, Isaac. Sarah's demand displeased Abraham greatly because Ishmael was his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be upset about the boy or your slave wife. Do all that Sarah is telling you because through Isaac, your descendants will be counted. But I will also make the son of the slave wife into a great nation for he is your descendant too." Early in the morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He put them on her shoulders, gave her the child, and sent them away. So she went wandering aimlessly through the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water skin was gone, she shoved the child under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down by herself across from him at quite a distance, about a bow shot away. For she thought, I refuse to watch the child die. So she sat across from him and wept uncontrollably. But God heard the boy's voice. The angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and asked her, What is the matter, Hagar? Don't be afraid, for God has heard the boy's voice right where he's crying. Get up, help the boy up, and hold him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God enabled Hagar to see a well of water. She went over and filled the skin with water and then gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew. He lived in the wilderness and became an archer. He lived in the wilderness of Paran. His mother found a wife for him from the land of Egypt. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Here's the main application that I want to draw from this text that we just read. If we want to obey God more as Christians, the main message of Genesis 21 for us today is that we need to learn to trust God more. If we want to obey more, we need to learn to trust more. But in order to trust God, we have to be ready to be surprised. So are you ready to be surprised this morning? There's a couple of surprises in this text and what we're going to talk about. 
Now, let's think about Genesis a little bit more broadly. People laugh in the book of Genesis, but not always for the right reasons. Think of Genesis 18, where Abraham, God told Abraham that he would have a son with Sarah. Now, of course, Sarah was barren. She had no children. And when God spoke to Abraham, when he spoke to him that promise, they were both getting up in years, and she was beyond childbearing age. So how did Sarah respond to God's promise? Well, since it seemed impossible, she laughed, and not for joy. The text says, Genesis 18, 12, so Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And that shall I have pleasure could be translated, shall I conceive? You know, she's laughing in unbelief, maybe even sarcastically. She's thinking, ha, after all these years, how am I going to have a child? I mean, Abe, he's a dinosaur, and, and I kind of am too. How's that going to happen? So she laughs. But nothing's impossible for God. So three chapters later in Genesis 21, we see the fulfillment of God's promise. Sarah gives birth to a son, and she laughs again. Genesis 21, 6, right before the passage that we read. But this time she laughs for joy because of the blessing that she had received from the Lord. Matching her and Abraham's joy, God told them to name the child Isaac, which means he laughs. Yeah. So Abraham throws a party for Isaac, and we read about that in the first verse of our passage for this morning, the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on that day for Isaac because he was weaned. Have you ever been to a weaning party? <laughs> I, I mean, oh, except for Ken. <laughs> Where have you not been, brother? <laughs> um, you know, in Spain, any excuse for a party is wonderful, but even in Spain, I've never been to a weaning party. What, what is this weaning party? What is this about? Well, you've got to figure, you know, 4,000 years ago, life expectancy of infants wasn't what it is today. So when a child got to be two or three years old to the point where it could be weaned off of its mother, it's now more independent and it's much more likely that that child is going to survive. So they're throwing a party for Isaac because he's kind of beyond that initial stage. So they throw this party, but it wasn't all fun and games this day because Sarah saw Ishmael laughing at Isaac, or in the version that I read, mocking Isaac. Now, notice the text doesn't say, I think probably all your English versions are going to get it right, it doesn't say he was laughing with Isaac, right? So he's not playing with Isaac, and yeah, that's funny, Isaac, yeah, we're brothers, and he's laughing at him, and he's mocking him. So the word that's translated laughing at is the same word that shows up in verse 6 when it says that Sarah laughed. But it's got a different form. Are there any Hebrew nuts out there? We, we can talk afterwards. I'll tell you about the different form. So the form of this word laughing is the same one that shows up in Genesis 19. You remember in Genesis 19, Lot, who's Abraham's nephew, he warns his family about God's impending judgment on Sodom. That's where they live. And how does his family respond? They don't laugh with him. They laugh at him. They mock him. So this is, whatever Ishmael's doing, it's not good. He's laughing at Isaac, and Sarah's upset about it. It's possible, even, that Ishmael was abusing Isaac. Paul says in Galatians, in the text that we read earlier, that Ishmael persecuted Isaac. So maybe there's some, like, ancient bullying going on here. Sarah's not happy. She gets upset, and she says to Abraham, Genesis 21.10, "'Cast out this slave woman with her son.'" For the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. So Ishmael's laughing, Sarah's not. She's really upset. And one little clue in the text that makes it clear that she's really angry is that she calls Hagar a slave. Now, think back to Genesis 16 when Sarah and Abraham come up with this idea to have a son, to have an heir through Hagar. In Genesis, 6, Genesis 16, she's a servant. All right? At that point, in Genesis 16, Sarah's happy with Hagar. Not now. She's the slave. So there's this very um, negative. Uh, Sarah is not feeling warm fuzzies for Hagar right now. 
Sarah wants Abraham to give Hagar the boot. So she says to him, drive her out. And that's the same word that appears in Genesis 3.24 when God drives Adam out of the garden. So he's ask, she's asking Abraham to banish Hagar and her son. She, she doesn't want Abraham to just go to the next town over and, oh yeah, honey, go look for a little three-bedroom for Hagar and Ishmael, and maybe we can go see him from time to time. She wants them driven out far away. She doesn't want to see them ever again. Why did Sarah react like that? Well, of course, there's envy and there's rivalry between Sarah and Hagar after Ishmael's birth. But Sarah has a really specific reason for telling Abraham to send them away. Sarah doesn't want Ishmael to inherit. And we always think of Isaac as the promised son. He's the heir, but Ishmael's Abraham's son too. And initially, he had a right to inherit, and he could have been part of that promise that God had given to Abraham. Sarah doesn't want to have anything to do with that. So she tells Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael packing so that Isaac would inherit, inherit alone. The text tells us that Sarah's request doesn't make Abraham happy. It says that he was greatly displeased. Why? Why would he be displeased? He's already got Isaac. He's this longed-for, promised son. But the text tells us that Ishmael was his son too. This is really important. We have to catch this. It was hard for Abraham to banish Hagar and Ishmael because Ishmael was his son and he loved him. So what Sarah asks seems over the top to Abraham. Now, God intervenes. And here's our first surprise in the narrative. And what is surprising is not that God intervenes, but in favor of whom he intervenes. Because we read this text and we think, poor Hagar. <laughs> you know, her son was a little bit out of line, but now they're going to get sent away. Hagar doesn't have any hotel vouchers. She's heading out into the wilderness with a 13-year-old boy who's not ready to take care of her yet. Possibilities of survival are nil, and it just it seems so extreme, so it's not quite the same. But imagine that you've got a 13-year-old boy in some local middle school, and the school calls you up one day and says, hey, your boy was bullying somebody else, you know, Ishmael's bullying Isaac. And they don't say detention for your son. They say expelled, he's out, and guess what, you two. <laughs> Move out of the school district, go somewhere else, get away. So we read the narrative and we think, that's just a little too much to be sending Hagar and Ishmael away like that, isn't it? But God comes in and he says, Sarah's right. And that surprises us. God takes Sarah's side. He doesn't necessarily approve of her motivations. He's not saying this, all this rivalry and this jealousy and the thing that you did to begin with was a good idea. He's not saying that. But he is saying that Isaac is the one who's supposed to inherit. It's through Isaac that Abraham's offspring will be named. God had planned all along to bring blessing to the world through Abraham and his promised children, Isaac and Jacob. Think about Genesis 16. You know, Abraham had a son, but that wasn't God's plan, was it? God promised Abraham a son in Genesis 15. Genesis 16, the years are going by. Abraham and Sarah are looking at each other. We're not having children. And so Sarah says, here, have my servant girl, and maybe we can have an heir through her. That was not part of God's plan. And so now God's setting things straight. Ishmael's out, and Isaac is in. He's the only one who's going to inherit. So Abraham obeys, and he banishes the boy. And there's, there's some little details in the text that we need to pick up on. The text says in verse 14 that Abraham rose early in the morning. Early in the morning to go out and do this really difficult deed that God had called him to do. Can you think of another time, just a little later in Genesis, when Abraham gets up early in the morning to do something really difficult? In the very next chapter... Genesis 22, the very same words, Abraham gets up early in the morning and he takes Isaac up on the mountain where his plan is to sacrifice him. And this parallel is important because we see that God called Abraham to give up his beloved son not once but twice. 
First Ishmael and then Isaac. And both times, Abraham obeyed. Abraham treats Hagar with, with compassion. He doesn't give her much. He gives her some bread and some water. But it seems like he's trusting God that somehow God's going to take care of her and Ishmael. And he has a reason to trust. God's told him twice, I will make a great nation of Ishmael. So he sends Hagar, Ishmael away. They wander off into the wilderness, but Abraham has that promise. So after a little while of wandering in arid lands, the water runs out and and Ishmael gets dehydrated. So Hagar lays him under a bush and she goes a ways away. The text says that she was about a bow shot away. Uh, That's maybe because Ishmael was going to grow up to be an archer. So that's maybe why that distance is described in that fashion. Hagar says, let me not look on the death of the child. Maybe she's praying. Maybe she's not. But God hears. But God doesn't hear her. He hears the boy crying. And there's probably a play on words here because Ishmael means God hears. So God hears the boy crying, and he comes and he talks to Hagar, tells her to pick up the child, and tells her, again, I will make him into a great nation. There's another important detail here. God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well. We don't know if the well was already there, or if God put it there miraculously. Both are possible. But he opens Hagar's eyes, and she finds the provision for the salvation of her boy. In Genesis 22, when Abraham's on the mountain, he's about to sacrifice Isaac, he lifts up his eyes. And he sees, tangled in the bushes, a ram. And it's God's provision for the salvation of his son. Do you see the parallels? So both in Genesis 21 and in Genesis 22, Abraham obeys. Twice he's ready to give his beloved boys over to apparent death. And both times, God intervenes and God provides for him. So, let's start bringing this a little bit closer to us. Ask the question, put yourself in Abraham's shoes. How could Abraham obey God in such a radical way? I mean, the text says he got up early in the morning to do this thing that is really, really difficult. What might get you out of bed early in the morning, eager to obey God and do something difficult. It's going to take more than a cup of coffee for me, I can tell you that. Well, I could tell you what it wasn't. Abraham did not think that he needed to obey God in order to get right with him. Abraham didn't think that he somehow needed to be more deserving of God's acceptance than he already was. He didn't think there were just maybe a few commandments that still needed to be obeyed so that he could be worthy of God's blessing. And we know that for a couple reasons. In the first place, in Genesis 15, when Abraham believes God's promise, God's going to give him a son. Even though they're past childbearing age, his wife's womb is barren, there's nothing in her womb, and he says, I will put a son in there. And Abraham believes, Genesis 15, 6 says, his faith was credited to him as righteousness. So right there, right in Genesis 15, just because he trusted God, God said, I will take you as my friend. I accept you. Abraham's got that. He's already God's friend. He's already righteous in God's eyes. He doesn't have to add to that by obeying more to somehow fill out God's plan for his righteousness. But there's another reason why we know that Abraham wasn't motivated to give over his sons because he thought that he somehow had to please God more or earn more merit with God. And that is that Paul talks about Ishmael and Isaac in Galatians chapter 4, which is the text that we had read earlier. And in Galatians 4, Paul's point is precisely to say that people don't get right with God on the basis of their own efforts. That's exactly what he's saying. And he goes back to Ishmael and Isaac to prove that point. So remember what what Galatians is all about. I thought today we could maybe do a two-for-one. We could have a sermon in Genesis 21 and a sermon in Galatians 4. Would that be okay? How long does Ken usually preach? I mean, you know, it kind of, it it, it goes on. Okay, that's how it feels, right? But then what the reality is, 
No, I won't go quite that long, but... All right, thanks, bro. Um, <laughs> that's kind of scary, isn't it? I have freedom. Yeah, how long is this guy going to go? What is Galatians all about? Well, there's these guys that show up in the churches in Galatia, and they said to the Galatians that besides having faith in Jesus, it's also necessary to obey the law of Moses to be saved. You've probably heard that before. But I want you to think about that for a minute. I mean, put yourself in the shoes of the Galatians. They're Gentiles, which means they're not Jews. And they're not familiar with the Mosaic law, all the dietary laws and the calendar, and there's that circumcision thing, right? So you're a Gentile in, in the Galatian church. And these guys come along and they say, no, if you really want to be saved, it's not enough just to believe in Jesus. You've got to obey the Mosaic law too. Well, I think I would say, well, gee, I sure like my bacon. Are you following me? You know, pork chops, a little bit of seafood. Um, and that circumcision thing, is, that does not sound appealing. But the Galatians were doing it. They're like starting to, to, to maybe follow the calendar, maybe some of the dietary laws. They're contemplating circumcision. Why in the world would they do that? Have you ever stopped to think about that? I think it's because we as human beings, after the fall into sin... All of us have this constant temptation to depend on our own contribution to get right with God. So we have this, this default factory setting. You know, when you get a phone, it's got like a default setting on it. It's got this factory setting. It's, it's programmed. It's programmed to run in, in a certain way. And so when you turn it on, it works because it's got this default setting. Well, we have a default setting too, and it's this. I got this. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty good person, really. Uh, look, at, look at me, compared to that guy over there, I'm doing pretty good. You know, we can think about Luke 18. There's the Pharisee and the publican. And the Pharisee prays and he gives thanks to God. He says, well, yeah, I thank, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like that guy. We criticize the Pharisee, but there's a little Pharisee in each one of our hearts. And so there's this tendency to think like, and, and you, you see this with people that maybe non-Christians that you interact with, and they'll say, oh, yeah, oh, man, man, it's really necessary to believe in Jesus? I mean, if there is a God and if there's going to be a judgment, I'm pretty good. Why wouldn't he let me into heaven? This is the human default setting, and it's because we're proud, and it's because we're not realistic. How, how good do we have to be to get into heaven? You have to be perfect, Right? So Paul writes to the Galatians to correct that error, and basically he says to them, you don't got this. He, said, he insists with the Galatians that they need to trust only in Jesus and not in their own efforts to be right with God. So Paul proves his point, referring to the story from Genesis that we just explained. And he says that Abraham blew it when he tried to have an heir with Hagar. So in Galatians 4.23, he says that Ishmael is the son of the slave. He was born according to the flesh. Does that sound like a good thing? Anybody here want to be born according to the flesh in this way? Probably not. What does that mean? Well, that word flesh at least means something like human effort. That's what it means in Galatians 3.3. You started off by the Spirit. Why are you trying to be perfected in the flesh by human effort? In Genesis 16, Abraham and Sarah when they come up with this idea to have a child through Hagar, they're not trusting in God's provision. They're trying to get the job done themselves in their own way. And so the word flesh here, the son born of the flesh, might even have sinful connotations because I don't think that God was really happy with Abraham when he was trying to have a son through Hagar. Ishmael was born as the result of Sarah and Abraham's scheming apart from God. And God was not going to give the blessing to Abraham in that way. Now, Isaac, on the other hand, was born according to promise, the text tells us. He was born through God's intervention. It was a complete miracle. It was only God's work. There was no deservedness or any contribution on Abraham and Sarah's part. Ishmael was born of human initiative, Isaac of divine now get this, this is what we need to get from Galatians 4. For Paul, Ishmael and Isaac represent two religions. Ishmael is the religion of the unbelieving Jews 
who depended on their own works to be acceptable to God. I'm going to present myself to God on the basis of my own righteousness. That's Ishmael. Isaac, on the other hand, born according to the promise, he represents true believers that depend only on God's work to save them. Only these will be blessed together with Abraham. So we're going to pause here for just a minute. Abraham in Galatians is an example of being right with God by sheer faith. Like we already said, Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed. It was credited to him as righteousness. And Paul is calling the Galatians, and us as well, to follow in Abraham's footsteps and just trust in Jesus, nothing else. We have to resist the temptation to think that somehow we can make contributions to God's plan for our right standing before him. Like somehow we could pay heavenly taxes in order to have a right to the blessing. Somehow we have to pay back this mortgage that God has given us. We have this tendency to think it can't be fair that God just gives it to me. I have to do something. But if we think that way consistently, we run the risk of being cut off from Christ. This is Galatians chapter 4. If anybody thinks that they're going to be justified through the law, they will be cut off from Christ, they will have fallen from grace. Why is that? I mean, you can understand the kind of temptation of the Galatians. You know, we're believing in Jesus, and these other guys are just coming along, and they're telling us just to do a few more good things to kind of whatever. Well, I'm doing good stuff. Why is this bad? Well, the problem is, if you're depending on your own resources, you're not really trusting in Christ. Explicitly, implicitly, you're saying, Jesus didn't do enough, and I have to do a little more. Now, so what one of the applications to this is, in the same way that Paul writes to the Galatians, and he says, don't leave behind your simple faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, for acceptance with God. The same is true for us. Throughout our Christian life, we have to constantly resist that temptation to think that somehow we have to be more deserving of God's favor than we already are. We are as deserving of God's favor as we could possibly be if we're trusting in Jesus because Jesus is deserving of his Father's favor. But I want to say a little more about this, and this brings us back to Abraham's obedience. Some people think that in order to motivate people to obey, we have to tell them that their salvation depends on their obedience. This may come as a surprise, but a lot of people think that stand, if, if our standing with God, our right standing with God, isn't somehow based on what we do, we won't be motivated to obey. I, I read recently in an evangelical scholar's book where he said, he was talking about that somehow our works have got to factor into the final judgment. Somehow our final judgment before God has to depend not only on Jesus, but also on our works. Because he said, if we don't preach that, it bruises the nerve of obedience, of Christian obedience. And that is not true. So I said earlier, Abraham didn't go out and obey because he thought somehow he needed to be more deserving of God's favor. In fact, I think if he really would have thought that, he probably wouldn't have been so ready to obey. Usually people and churches that have this, we can use the word, legalistic bent to them tend to be dry, tend to be arid, tend to be divisive. To the degree that that message is preached consistently, it doesn't produce obedience, it produces problems. Galatians 5. Think about Galatians, before the fruit of the Spirit, all that good stuff. Before that, Paul criticizes the Galatians. He says, you're, you're biting each other, you're devouring one another. And that's that, that message coming in from the outside that you've got to add something to Jesus to be saved. It was producing bad fruit in their lives. So why did Abraham obey God in such a radical way? I think it's safe to conclude that Abraham obeyed, not because he thought he needed to make himself more worthy of God's blessings. So what was it that got Abraham out of bed early in the morning, twice, to hand over his beloved sons? It's simple. He trusted in God. Now, the younger Abraham, and we, we, we get like the span of Abraham's, a good span, decades of Abraham's life in Genesis, don't we? The younger Abraham, he trusted 
God credited it to him as righteousness, but his faith was weak at times, wasn't it? So when he's going along and he's got this beautiful woman next to him that's his wife, he says, oh, no, that's not my wife, that's my sister. <laughs> he's, he's not really trusting right there, is he? Oh, I don't have a son yet. Okay, Sarah, whatever you say, I'll go off with your servant girl. He's not trusting. The younger Abraham's faith sometimes wobbled. But the older Abraham had learned to trust God. God told him, banish your son. But God also told him, I will make that son into a great nation. And Abraham trusted what God said, and he sent Ishmael off. He obeyed. God told him, sacrifice your other son. But he had already told Abraham that Isaac will be your heir. And so Abraham doesn't understand. And the author of Hebrews says that Abraham thought he was going to get Isaac back like resurrected. He knows that God's going to work it out. He trusts and he goes up the mountain ready to sacrifice his son. I want to be ready to obey God like this. I imagine that you do too. Don't you want to be honest, even when it's really going to cost you? Sometimes telling the truth, you know what's going to happen if you tell the truth. There's going to be consequences afterward. What gives you the strength to tell the truth in that difficult situation? Well, it's God's promise. In Romans 8, 28, for example, He will work all things for good. Even if things go south after you tell the truth, God will work it for good. He'll provide for you. He'll care for you. You have to trust in that promise if you're going to tell the truth in a difficult situation. Or how about speaking up for Christ in front of you non-believing friends, knowing that they're probably going to ridicule you. They may give you a really bad time. You may even jeopardize one of those friendships. It's a risk sometimes to share the gospel, isn't it? What gives you the strength? What should give you the strength to open your mouth and talk about Jesus in those difficult situations? To trust God's promise that in the midst of that, he'll give you the words to speak, that his word does not go out void, that with the power of the Holy Spirit, he applies his word to people's hearts. People get converted. And if they don't, he uses that too, and he will take care of you. He will provide for you. He will protect you. Do you want to give generously to people in need, sacrificially? Isn't that hard? It's, it's hard to give sacrificially. Well, there's even a little difference between generously and sacrificially. Sacrificially means I'm going to give something else up in order to give here. I, I want to be like that. But sometimes it's kind of scary even. I'm giving sacrificially. What motivates me to do that? What motivates me is God's promise that he will care for me. He will provide for me. He will cause things to abound for me as I'm giving, and that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I think one of the main points of Genesis 21 is that God is worthy of our trust. And if we want our lives to be characterized by joyful obedience, this radical obedience, joyful obedience too. Let me say one more thing about Abraham. He doesn't grumble. You see that? And I would say, ah, maybe you're reading between the lines there or whatever. Well, I'll tell you what, the Bible talks about grumbling a lot. Israel grumbles all the time. <laughs> Christians grumble too. Paul tells us not to grumble. Abraham doesn't grumble. He gets up early in the morning, in the morning and he goes. If we want to be like that, we need to learn to trust in God like Abraham did over the span of his life. I want to be like the old Abraham. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I, I feel pretty good now. I don't, I'm not saying I want to have all the back pains and all the stuff like that, but I want to have the same kind of faith that the old Abraham had. And you know what? We have advantages over Abraham. You might think, well, God was speaking directly to Abraham. I mean, that had to be great. But guess what? Abraham only saw Jesus Christ as a shadow. Abraham knew that God had to do something to fix the problem of sin in the world. And he knew that the solution was going to come through one of his descendants, but he did not understand exactly what Jesus Christ would be like. And we are on the other side of that. Abraham's 2,000 years before Jesus were 2,000 years after, and we have the Scriptures. The Bible tells us about Jesus, and God shows that he's trustworthy in the person of Jesus. Think about it. Again, a woman 
who doesn't have a child in her womb, God puts one there. And he's a beloved son, but not just of Abraham, not just of Joseph and Mary. He's God's own beloved son. And he grows up, Jesus Christ, he lives a life of perfect obedience. And if there's anybody who didn't deserve to die on the cross, it's Jesus. And here's the last surprise. Jesus goes up on that mountain. And unlike Isaac, who was spared, his father does not spare him. And there he dies. And he does that for us, you see? He does it so that we can be forgiven of our sins. He takes that penalty that we deserve for our sins. Is God trustworthy? He's already shown it in the person of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we doubt God, but we have to look back and say, he's already done the biggest thing. He sent his son Jesus to die for us. How is he not going to take care of the little things in my life? Romans 8.23, which you, were, you heard, how long ago was that? <laughs> Romans 8.23, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God's already done the big thing. We can trust that he's going to be good to take care of us in all the other areas of our lives. May God help us to give up our own schemes, like the younger Abraham, and learn to trust in him like the older Abraham, because he cares for us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word, for the scriptures, and everything that's in there is for our edification. Genesis 21 is for our edification. We thank you for the way that that text is unpacked in Galatians 4, which helps us understand it. Thank you for the rest of Genesis. We thank you for the explanation of Abraham's life, and we see how he grows in faith. And as he grows in faith, he grows also in obedience. So we pray that you'd help us to be like Abraham, trusting in you for our righteousness, and also trusting in you for our provision so that we can obey you in the radical ways that you call us to. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.